Hi, I'm Pat. Welcome to Passion of the Geeks Unplugged. Usually Greg and I talk about geek and pop culture and everything else we enjoy. But sometimes there are things that only one of us is an expert in. This is what Passion of the Geeks Unplugged is for. Shorter, unedited, straight to the point. Unplugged. So, let's not lose any time. I might have mentioned it before, but I love Sherlock Holmes. I love the short stories, I love the books, I love some of the movies, the audio dramas, and I enjoy a lot of the stuff that tried to add more to the Sherlock Holmes mythos. There is a lot I could talk about when it comes to Sherlock Holmes, but most of it are things that would be fun to discuss with Greg. So, let's do that. For now, I want to briefly focus on the easiest way how you can become Sherlock Holmes. Through computer games. Even though parts of Sherlock Holmes have been in public domain for quite some time, surprisingly few Sherlock Holmes games actually exist. While I don't own all of them, especially not the hidden object casual games, I have less than 20 games featuring Holmes. Considering that there are more than 900 Sherlock Holmes societies all over the world and more than 200 different film depictions of him, making it the most portrayed character in the Book of Records, I find this surprising. Why is that? Well, let's look at the first Sherlock Holmes game. The 1987 Sherlock, The Riddle of the Crown Jewels by legendary interactive fiction company Infocom. The lead designer, Bob Bates, asked himself how he could portray the great detective in a game. He feared that the player would stumble through his text-only recreation of Victorian London, doing little silly things that would not be fitting for the great detective. So he decided not to let the player be Sherlock Holmes at all. In the game, Dr. Moriarty had stolen the crown jewels just a couple of days before the coronation ceremony for Queen Victoria's 15th anniversary. But Moriarty left a riddle that was an obvious challenge for Holmes. Thinking it to be a trap, Sherlock Holmes lets Watson solve the riddle of his own. Sounds strange? <laughs> Well, it certainly is a little disappointing. While this presented an interesting point of view, it reduced the character of Sherlock Holmes to a rather useless sidekick that just stumbles along Dr. Watson, not helping at all, which I think is exactly what should not have happened. Still, playing as Watson would be interesting, but I think it would be a lot more fun to control Sherlock through Watson indirectly by asking him appropriate questions so he could give you his observations and deductions. Hmm. But let's fast forward five years. In 1992, Electronic Arts allowed us to play as the great detective in their point-and-click graphic adventure The Last Files of Sherlock Holmes, The Case of the Serrated Scalpel. There were other games before that, but I don't want to go into them at this point. The case of the serrated scalpel opens with a murdered actress in a way very similar to the infamous murders by Jack the Ripper. As Sherlock Holmes, you explore London in a very early Lucasfilm games-like way. The graphics consists of beautiful VGA pixel art and the music fits very well. This time the game tries to depict Sherlock's skills through its interface. Examining objects or people immediately gives you his typical observation and deduction. You know, like in the stories when Holmes always tells everything about his new client just by looking at him or her as a demonstration of his abilities. This is what the game does when examining something or someone. And that's a lot of fun and feels very Sherlocky. They kind of cannot keep this momentum through the entire game, but that's okay. 
For an adventure enthusiast, the game might not have enough traditional puzzles, as the case is solved mostly by examining and talking, but for a Sherlock Holmes game, that is very okay in my opinion. The 1996 sequel, The Case of the Roaster 2, plays basically the same, except it is now in Super VGA with pre-rendered high-resolution backgrounds and filmed actors. This game opens with a bomb in the Diogenes Club that mortally wounds Sherlock's brother Mycroft, which starts you off as Dr. Watson once again. But unlike in the Riddle of the Crown Jewels, you switch back to Sherlock Holmes for most of the game, giving you the same experience as in the previous game. Let us once again fast forward to the year 2002. Frogwares had acquired the Sherlock Holmes license and their first Holmes game was The Mystery of the Mummy. But I don't want to talk about that. Also, not about its sequel, Secret of the Silver Earring. Because both are... Um, <laughs> okay, I guess. But, yeah, not very noteworthy. It's with their third game, The Awakened, that Frogwares began to find their style for their Sherlock Holmes games. It's also an interesting entry to Sherlock Holmes because it mixes Holmes with Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, which is not exactly my cup of tea, but might be something you enjoy. The game uses quite a few gameplay aspects that are now a fixed part of Frogwares' Holmes formula, and honestly, I'm so glad they refined their formula, because I think it's awesome. And while I think it works fairly well in Sherlock Holmes vs. Arsene Lupin and Sherlock Holmes vs. Jack the Ripper, I also think they really nailed it with The Testament of Sherlock Holmes. And then they perfected it with Crimes and Punishments and The Devil's Daughter. The three most important key ingredients for the Frogwares formula are a very observant examination of objects and people. It kind of like in the lost files of Sherlock Holmes, and of course very close to what happens in his written stories. And in a way, the more modern movie and TV productions try to depict his keen eye, or the way he sees the world, giving the player some deductions right away. Then there's the built-in hint system that works in a very Sherlock Holmes way. Using the hint system, Sherlock notices something important, if it is nearby, by letting that object flash. A little bit like in the TV series Psych, when Sean notices something. It feels very natural for Sherlock, and actually not like a hint system at all. And finally, the deduction board. Whether it's displayed as a real board with notes on it, or as synapses of his brain that connect. The deduction board lets you review your evidence, connect them and draw conclusions. It's so much fun to do that and you positively feel like Sherlock Holmes when your deductions fall into place. Crimes and Punishments perfect that this in a very suspenseful way. As Sherlock Holmes, the player can make the wrong deductions and bring the wrong person to justice. I mean, this basically only happens if the player draws a conclusion too soon. But it makes a game losable. And I love that. I mean, even in literature, Holmes wasn't right all the time. Frogwares is currently making a new Sherlock Holmes game called Chapter One. That will feature Holmes as a younger man and solving the murder of his own mother. And I'm really looking forward to this. This time, Frogwares adds an open-world element to their formula, and I'm very excited to see how this will work. I would have loved to say that I'm cautiously optimistic, but really, I'm so hyped for this. I can hardly wait to be Sherlock Holmes again. So, this is it for this week. If you like Passion of the Geeks, a rating or a subscription in your favorite podcatcher would be awesome. We're on all major podcasting services and on 
www.passionofthegeeks.com and on YouTube. You can send questions and suggestions to passionofthegeeks at gmail.com and you can find us on Twitter at passionotgeeks. So, thank you for listening and take care. Thank you.